Hello YouTubers and welcome to the JK Lenses review of the Nikon 28-105 f3.5-4.5 AFD lens. As usual this review is in four sections. Firstly we run down the specification list for this lens and then have a look at its handling and everyday use. Then we check out its optical performance and have a look at some of the alternatives which are available. At the time it was built, between 1998 and 2006, this lens was Nikon's mid-price standard zoom lens, offering a bit more reach at the long focal length end than most standard zooms, and a fairly fast maximum aperture which stays around f4 across the whole zooming range. The lens predates the AFS silent wave motor system, and is focused mechanically by the camera with a screwdriver blade sticking out of the lens mount. The lens has a closest focusing distance of half a metre, but in the 50 to 105 mm focal length range, it is provided with a macro facility accessed by throwing a switch. This allows the lens to focus down to just 22 cm, and at this distance it produces images with a reproduction ratio of 1 to 2. This means that the image on an FX sensor will be exactly half the size of the object itself. Despite its compact size, the lens contains 16 elements arranged in 12 groups, with one of them being an aspherical element. The whole idea of standard zoom lenses like this is to give you a bit more flexibility over the standard 50mm focal length, which as we can see from this churchyard shot can sometimes be a bit cramped. This lens therefore lets you zoom back to the much more satisfactory 35mm and the very usefully wide 28mm. Following the marked focal lengths in the other direction we have the slightly telephoto 70mm, the popular portrait focal length of 85mm and the lens's longest focal length at the short telephoto 105mm. In addition engaging the macro switch means we can get up nice and close to all kinds of tiny objects opening up all sorts of possibilities without the need to switch to a dedicated macro lens. In everyday use, the thing that hits you straight away about this lens is its compact size and weight, given the range of focal lengths and facilities that are packed inside. At just 82mm long and 73mm across, even with the HP18 lens hood fitted, this lens can fit neatly into an outdoor coat pocket, a feature which I personally find extremely useful. Starting our tour of the lens at the lens mount, we're not too surprised to find there's no rubber weather sealing gasket. Given the lens's price point, the ultimate in weather sealing was obviously never a priority. Moving down the lens, we find the familiar aperture ring, along with a tiny switch to lock it in the minimum aperture position. This will need to be done if you fit the lens to a more modern Nikon DSLR body, where the aperture is set electronically by the camera. Next up is the well-proportioned rubberized zooming ring. Although it's moved easily with thumb and forefinger, this is one of the areas where the lens shows up its budget pedigree. As you turn the zooming ring there's a great deal of activity inside and the lens trombones to become almost half as long again. The next item along the lens is the switch for engaging the close focusing macro facility. With the switch in the normal position the lens will focus down only to about half a metre but this obviously reduces the range and increases the speed of the autofocus. When the switch is in the orange macro position the lens can focus all the way down to 22 centimetres where it can achieve its half actual size reproduction ratio. An important point with this switch, which the colour coded markings on the lens try to remind you, is that it can only be operated in the 50 to 105mm focal length range. Clinging onto the front of the lens is its extremely thin focusing ring. In common with many of Nikon's early autofocus lenses, it's clear that the idea of manually focusing this lens was never really taken very seriously. The focusing ring is extremely thin, and the entire focusing range is crammed into just over 90 degrees worth of throw. In addition, there's no switch on the lens for moving between auto and manual focus. This has to be done using the switch on the camera body. I guess it's at this point in the review that I'm meant to say this lens has the prehistorically slow AFD system, plodding along miles behind its near instantaneous AFS successors. However, here at JK Lenses we'd like to take issue with the idea that buying an AFD lens means you have to suffer with agriculturally slow autofocus. Firstly, the mechanical rather than electronic link between the camera and the lens, in the case of AFD, means that the overall speed of the focusing system will be very dependent on the quality of the motor in the camera body. This can be seen clearly with a lot of Nikon's early AF and AFD lenses. Although their focusing dials can turn very slowly when they're fitted to an early film AF camera body, they generally move much more smartly into action when they're fitted to a suitably equipped modern DSLR body. Although much is made of the focusing power of modern AFS lenses in their marketing, it's important to remember that the lens's role in the focusing system is essentially a very passive one. If you think about situations where the autofocus system has actually lost you great pictures, it's very likely to have been when the autofocus sensors in the camera body took too long to acquire focus or couldn't hold on to it. The bottom line in terms of autofocus speed with this lens is that when it's fitted to a capable modern DSLR body, the difference in speed between it and more modern AFS standard zooms is absolutely marginal. If you'd like me to show you examples of photographs which the AFD system on this lens has lost, which a modern AFS lens would have got, then there just aren't any. 
In front of the focusing ring is the bayonet for the excellent and reversible HB18 lens hood. If you're buying one of these lenses, don't forget the lens hood was always an optional extra. This means if you buy one in all its original packaging, then the lens hood won't be included. Finally, the very front of the lens has a 62mm filter thread, which doesn't rotate either in focusing or zooming. Despite its budget appearance, the optical quality of this lens is very much towards the upper end of what you might expect from a zoom lens. Levels of sharpness, contrast and colour saturation are all excellent, allowing the lens to produce accurate and punchy images across a wide range of subjects. Performance at its widest apertures is very competent, and its ability to focus closer than most lenses of this type make it surprisingly effective at isolating subjects. Bokeh quality is generally okay, although this is another area where the lens sometimes lets its budget pedigree show through, with some rather spooky effects on occasions. Very surprising for a lens of this type and price point is the flatness of its field. Low cost and even some quite expensive standard zooms are notorious for rendering straight lines as slightly curved, particularly at the edges of the frame at wide focal lengths. Although many standard zooms expect the user to live with this effect, the 28105 has clearly been designed to keep this effect to an absolute minimum, resulting in surprisingly accurate images in this regard. The results of my Gary's door test show that this isn't just my imagination. Shooting wide open at the minimum focusing distance, we can see that barrel distortion, where horizontal and vertical lines bow outwards slightly, is at a very low level. Similarly, at 105mm, pincushion distortion, where vertical and horizontal lines curve inwards slightly, is barely noticeable. These are really excellent results for a lens of this price, and if you look at some of the other reviews on this channel, you'll see that it's outperforming lenses costing many times more. The white garage door test shows clear levels of fall-off, where the corners of the image are not as bright as the centre, but once again the levels shown here are no worse than standard zoom lenses costing many times more, and are only very occasionally noticeable in real pictures. Although not a dedicated macro prime lens, the macro facility on this lens works remarkably well, allowing this lens to produce excellent images of subjects which many other lenses simply wouldn't be able to focus on. This well thought out combination of features and optical qualities really does allow this lens to stake a claim for the title of Swiss Army Knife, given the high standard of images it can produce across such a wide range of subjects, and all from such a quite literally pocket sized package. In this section we have a look at how the 28-105 fits into the grand scheme of Nikon FX standard zoom lenses. Lined up below we have some of the popular choices increasing in price from left to right. On the extreme left we have just the one lens essentially representing a pile of Nikon budget to mid price standard zoom lenses from the past. When compared to the 28-105 they generally offer lower quality, higher distortion and fewer features for roughly the same amount of money. Moving very slightly up the price range, we have the 28-105 itself. Given its range of features and the quality of images which it produces, its current price on the second-hand market is just ridiculously low. Taking a very substantial step up in price, we come to the very popular 24-120 f4 standard zoom lens. This lens offers very similar optical quality, but with slightly higher levels of distortion. I'm pretty confident that if you mixed up the test pictures from this review with those from the review of the 24-120, printed them all out and spread them all over the table, then with only a couple of exceptions it would be pretty much impossible to tell one from the other. Interestingly, if you did the same with the white garage door test pictures, then it would be pretty easy to spot the 24-120 with its higher levels of distortion. As regular viewers will know, here at JK Lenses we often take a very simplistic view of lens quality in our constant search for the very highest optical quality at the very lowest price. Consequently, with this approach, we really must continue to raise one eyebrow at the price which Nikon charged for the 24-120 f4, even though it's an excellent lens. Although there's absolutely no way of claiming that the 24-120 gives improved optical quality over the 28-105, in the world of real photography rather than lens reviews, obviously things are never quite that simple. Features like the latest vibration reduction and the ability to zoom right out to 24 rather than 28mm are both features which will allow the 24 to 120 to get images which the 28 to 105 would simply miss, albeit at a substantial price difference. The 28 to 105's excellent image quality at low, low prices obviously asks similar questions of Nikon's professional standard zooms like the 24 to 70 f2.8. The difference in image quality is very, very slight indeed, and the difference in price is very, very large. However, as is often the case with Nikon's professional lenses, it's not just improved optical quality which you're paying for. Although both lenses can produce very similar quality images, if you had to earn your living by standing outside in the pouring rain taking pictures with these lenses, then the difference would soon become extremely clear. The 28-105 and the 24-120 both trombone like crazy, and would soon end up with all kinds of weather inside them. The 24-70 f2.8 lenses are all internally focusing, and do their zooming under the cover of the lens hood. Consequently, the f2.8 standard zooms will happily take pictures in the most adverse of conditions all day long. Incidentally, if you decide that professional standards of build quality are the USP for you, then don't forget the earlier versions of the 24-70 f2.8 standard zoom. 
The older 28 to 70 f 2.8 lens can do a very similar job at a very much lower price than the very latest 24 to 70 f 2.8. And if you can compromise at the wide end, then the elderly 35 to 70 f 2.8 is built like a tank, produces excellent images, and can be had for very reasonable prices on the second hand market. Consequently, although the value for money ratings of these lenses can look a bit out of kilter, if you include features and build quality along with optical quality, then there is a kind of a logic to this group of lenses, which will hopefully allow you to decide which is the best one for you. It's hard to imagine a photographer's camera bag where the 28 to 105 couldn't earn its place many times over. It provides a flexible range of features and impressive optical quality in a handy pocket-sized package. The fact that it can cost less than some filters puts its value for money rating absolutely through the roof. I hope you found something useful here, and if so, please subscribe. Your comments, whether you agree or disagree, are always very welcome, so please type them below. And as always, very many thanks for watching.